Uh, in the audience. Um, it falls to me to, to say a few introductory words today, and I'll, I'll not occupy too much of your time, but it struck me that it's worth reflecting on what's been happening in the Republic of Ireland with historical work on the Second World War, where we can say that there has been a lot of revisionism taking place over the past, probably more than the past 10 years, but even going back to the late 1980s, when Trevor Salmon's book was published called An All Neutral Neutral. And this essentially argued that uh, while the Irish Free State was in theory a neutral power, that actually the Free State government had provided significant uh, help and support to the Allies in terms of intelligence particularly. Um, more recently, I think that's been pushed rather too far by works, uh, for example, by Michael Kennedy looking at the Irish Coast Watching Service, where he seems to conclude that that plays a major role in uh, British, American, and wider ally planning for D-Day, which I think is to override the pudding a little. But in any case, this shows us how much the historiography has, has changed on these topics. If we were looking at this, 20, 25 years ago, we'd probably get a fairly straightforward picture of this loyal era and loyal Ulster. But we're now getting a much more nuanced view. Um, as I said, the idea that the Irish government is actually quite supportive of the Allies. And in the papers that we'll hear today, we'll see the varieties of the Northern Ireland experience within a wider British uh, framework. Um, we'll see that things could be as bad in Belfast as in most of the other major industrial cities uh, in the UK in terms of the blitz, uh, where Belfast uh, takes uh, proportionally very high casualties compared to other cities in uh, the UK. Um, in terms of the economy, uh, I've had a bit of a taste, or some of Phil Bollinshaw's work on this in article form, not unfortunately in the book, but a, a distinct sense there that there's a lot of the rhetoric of a war economy very much like that in the rest of the UK, but actually some firms have real trouble gearing up to uh, a wartime output level comparable to that in GB. Others do manage it uh, reasonably well. And of course, uh, uh, William Butler's paper on the Ulster Home Guard, a thesis that I'd be uh, privileged of supervising, so I certainly had a chance to see all of this uh, in draft. Um, a very interesting uh, breakdown there, where we've got the Home Guard formed in Ulster, as in the rest of the UK, but with a, a definite sectarian element and link to the Ulster Special Constabulary in Northern Ireland, which isn't obviously happening elsewhere in the UK, where the Home Guard is formed within the Territorial Army framework, broadly speaking. So um, really, I, I think that's just my uh, initial thoughts on this, are some ideas about how Northern Ireland differs from uh, the Irish Free State of Europe in the war, and some thoughts about how the Northern Ireland context should be understood within the British context. Um, and really, at the end of today's conference, we can perhaps reflect on this again and think about, is there a distinctive Northern Ireland experience of the Second World War? Does it fit right sound within the British framework? And what is the, the sort of Irish dimension of it? So I think uh, <coughs> we're at S the time, uh, it's time for me to hand over to Bram Barton, uh, someone who I suspect needs a little introduction to this audience. Uh, Bram taught for many years at uh, FA, the Institute for Further and Higher Education, and more recently at the Open University, from which he has only very recently retired. Uh, his PhD um, first major publication was on Viking like, Brupra. Um, Prime Minister in 1943, uh, 1963. Um, he's gone on to do a number of other works of which the Blitz is possibly the most famous, but also important work on the Easter Rising and the uh, Courts Martial after the Easter Rising, and some very important contributions to the new history of Ireland about the world government in Northern Ireland. So um, I'm sure they'll bring all that uh, to his talk today as well. So without any further ado, Brown. Years ago, I wrote this book since uh, Belfast in the war years. And for the last uh, three or four years, I've been working on a sort of revised new, new book on the Blitz, really, basically. And this is what I go through in the next half hour is sort of a brief summary of some of the material which I'll cover in more detail, obviously, in the new publication. 
the uh, first um, the uh, over the period of it, um, J.C. McDermott, who was the Minister of Public Security, famous to comment of June 4, 1940, that uh, Belfast was less well protected than any major city or port in the United Kingdom. Others said in similar comments to uh, John Andrews, for example, the Prime Minister. And you can look, for example, um, um, at the shelters here. Um, the uh, private ones of bottom here are Gallagher's, which were more or less state of the art. Steam beds, air conditioning, no electricity, electricity supply, uh, and air conditioning, and so on. The one on the top uh, shows one of the Donegal Square East, divided by the corporation. There are two problems with the corporation provided public shelters. One was that there were simply too few, just a quarter of the city's population uh, could, have occupied, could have fitted into them if they'd been fully occupied at the time of the blitz. And also their design was defective. Uh, in a letter written up to the city, the, the mayor of Belfast on the 5th of May by a resident of Duncairn Gardens. Uh, later, uh, he, 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 the correspondent wrote obviously based on uh, recent experience, that the shelters locally have no supporting walls inside, and when the outside walls give way, many suffer agony and death. Atlantic Avenue is a good example. The appeal, why can't walls be built now inside to take the weight of the roof? The people in this end of the town who have suffered, and suffered, suffered in my opinion, a lot more than was necessary. And the, uh, sorry, the, the, the people in this end of town who have suffered, and suffered in my opinion, a lot more than was necessary. And it's the same people that would have left of them who will suffer again. Other aspects of uh, uh, defence, passive defences, uh, were also similarly lacking or defective. Uh, Belfast was just one small balloon barrage dogs, introduced in the dogs making 40. Uh, it had um, uh, one squadron of great fighters in September 1941, came over in June, uh, sorry, July 1940. But it wasn't uh, good for night fighting. Uh, whenever the pit started, there were no searchlights. There were 22 anti-aircraft guns, 16 heavy anti-aircraft guns. At that point, Liverpool had added one, Glasgow had 73. Uh, and also, there was very little evacuation from the city. Uh, at the time of the blitz, it was estimated that about 80,000 children were still living in Belfast. It was undoubtedly the case that uh, in late 1940, Belfast was much better prepared for an enemy invasion, airborne or seaborne, than it was for air attack. Yet Belfast had for long been regarded as the most vulnerable and likely target in Northern Ireland. The city was highly vulnerable, easily located, situated as one official stated, at the tip of a strip of the loch that night time and in the moonlight was like a silver pointer, pointer to the heart of the city, which was throbbing day and night with the war industry. Um, it had become, or was emerging, as a significant industrial munitions centre. The top photograph here shows Mackey's, which was regarded as being a dynamic firm, most dynamic firm in Northern Ireland, in World War I. The lower one so shows the production of short, at shorts, workers, in early 1941. In May 1940, the Harbour Commissioners estimated that uh, already 50,000 workers entered the port daily in daytime to work there. Um, a further reason for expecting that Belfast might be attacked was uh, its increased strategic significance uh, after the fall of France in June 1940. Subsequently, German establishment of group of bases uh, in northern France. They established their bases there. As a consequence, the Admiralty immediately decided to divert shipping from the UK's southern coastal ports uh, to those in the north and west, Liverpool, Glasgow, Belfast. And at the same time, because of the fall of France, Belfast was once more vulnerable to attack on a much greater scale. We could have the bombers no longer having to come from Germany, but could approach from their bases newly acquired in northern France and Holland. Um, why was Belfast so underprotected? Obviously, there are uh, uh, some reasons which readily come to mind. The fact that at first, it was regarded as being too remote, too insignificant. 
Uh, it was felt unlikely that the Luftwaffe would risk crossing the anti-aircraft defences of Great Britain where there were more worthwhile targets to attack Northern Ireland. The fact that Belfast's low immunity from attack until uh, the April 1941 again uh, encouraged that sort of view. Uh, the Blitz in Britain started in September 1940. There was also a widespread feeling, even shared by some officials, that if you might respect the neutrality of air and therefore not attack. Visitors to Northern Ireland informed uh, visitors from Britain, like Tom Harrison, the co founder of Mass Observation, when he came to Belfast, was struck by overall the relaxed atmosphere you find, the lack of any sense of war urgency. And this was, really, was one of the things he cited actually with the sudden death in front of the city hall, amongst other things. And he suggested that the people were behaving like this in Liverpool or in Birmingham, it could have caused a riot. To agree the political to a degree that Northern Ireland's political leadership might be blamed for this sort of casual atmosphere of lack of preparation, aging, <coughs> lack of energy and imagination. But it is also the case that uh, uh, key, key decisions were being made in Britain, uh, either directly or indirectly. You take, for example, shelter construction. In the context of the Battle of Britain, Britain desperately needed air drones in Northern Ireland for aircraft, which would, would protect shipping uh, in the Irish Sea, uh, in the northwest coast of the UK, uh, and also stretching out toward the Atlantic. And the Home Secretary therefore asked the Northern Ireland government on the phrase was a plea of vital urgency uh, to give every assistance, possible assistance, and uh, prioritise the construction of these airfields. Air, air this is mid 1940. The service requirements were met in full. 20 air bases were built in late 1940 and 1941. And as a direct result, as one Northern Ireland official stated, um, William Eilef, who was the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Public Security, he said in May 1941 that it had been impossible for Northern Ireland government to provide shelters as bricks, concrete and labour had not been available. The shelter building programme began in earnest in Belfast only in July 1941, two months after the Prince's War. Again, for example, with anti-aircraft guns, Belfast had few, they were in short supply. It was the Chiefs of Staff in London who determined their allocation. And they did so on the basis of two criteria. One was the likelihood of an area being attacked. In 1940, by the end of 1940, the Home Office uh, calculated that Liverpool had already had 48 areas. Um, Glasgow 4, Belfast had none. At the same time, another criteria was the strategic importance of any area, port, industrial area, uh, to the war effort. This wasn't a vacuous concept, it was uh, tabulated by counting up the number of what were uh, defined as being key points by which was meant things like, for example, munitions factories, docks, oil stores, iron steel plants, chemical works, etc. On this calculation, Belfast 39, Glasgow 86, Liverpool 230. However, from mid-1940, there was a growing acceptance and appreciation both amongst Northern Ireland and British ministers and officials that uh, Belfast would be attacked. Trade aid was becoming increasingly important in the war effort. In addition to that, Luftwaffe activity over Northern Ireland and Belfast was increasing, as, as evidence from that before that was the fact that between October uh, 1940 and April 1941, before the first air raid, there were 22 alerts from Belfast. What the what were the Luftwaffe doing in July, September of 1940? They were actively laying mines in Belfast Lock. Uh, in July 1940, almost on a daily basis, they were attacking shipping in the lock. And also, they were conducting reconnaissance uh, through the autumn of 1940, carrying information on convoys in Belfast Lock to be passed on to their U-boat bases in Brittany. They were also building up target programs which uh, would aid their bomber crews, this is late 1940, in preparation for an air raid on the Belfast. Uh, these were held by the Imperial War Museum. They were, uh, they were covered by Allied troops as they entered Berlin at the end of the war. And they contained aerial photographs, 
They also contained uh, more than survey maps, uh, identifying key targets. They typed summaries of the importance of these targets, how they were defended, the precise location of the anti-aircraft guns, etc., etc. And they were on uh, the firms that you'd expect, Harlem Wolf, Shorten Parliaments, Harvard Power Station, Port Facilities, Victoria Barracks, uh, the Naval Base in Derry, the airfields, etc. One odd inclusion, which I here, is uh, extracts or part of the contents of the um, target folder for the waterworks. The waterworks was described as being the main waterworks for Melbourne, which of course it had not been, apart from maybe one single decade in the 1840s. Uh, the state of the well displaced uh, and become the main water supply for the uh, Belfast, social for the Belfast. Uh, it may have been that they were knocked out by the readily available ordnance survey maps. They were freely available still to buy in Belfast uh, in 1940 and 1941. And they, you may have deduced, I have deduced from reading those and looking at those that the waterways were still operational.